You are watching With a Cup of Tea, a production of This House of Books, an independent bookstore cooperative and tea shop in downtown Billings. Now, here's our show. I, I, I want to say really quickly before we start, um, since uh, we've never actually met before, good to meet you, Sarah. Yeah, it's very good to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to meet you. <laughs> nice That's to no meet kidding. everyone. I know it's it's different to see everyone's faces. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's <laughs> interesting. Okay. In my email. <laughs> Welcome to this House of Books. Today we, we have with us all three editors of Eco Poetics Anthology, Poetics for the More Than Human World, an anthology of poetry and commentary. In alphabetical order, we have Mary Newell, Sarah Nolan, Bernard Quetschenbach. I want to ask each of you to tell us a little about yourself, including how you became involved with this project. And taking it in alphabetical order, Mary, why don't you start? Hi, so just for reference, this is the book we're talking about. I think you'll have a better picture going forward, but it's, um, <clears throat> it's, it's quite a project. This started because Dispatches for the Poetry Wars, which is an online site, um, the Site masters said they were getting tired of maintaining it and did anyone have any ideas? So it's always easier to have ideas than to implement them, at least in my world. So I piped up with the idea of having an issue on eco poetics. They thought that was a great idea. I never at that point envisioned that this would become the project that it has become. I was thinking of an online issue, etc. But once we got into it, of course, it's such a huge uh, field and so interesting to us and to many other people that it sort of took off from there. Okay, so yeah, and we'll get back to, we're gonna talk about eco-poetics in a minute. So uh, next, maybe Sarah, you could introduce yourself. I'm Sarah Nolan. Um, I'm a writing instructor at the University of Colorado in Boulder, um, but my, all of my previous research was in eco-poetics. So I came involved with the project uh, because Mary reached out to me um, and sort of persuaded me <laughs> that this was going to be a really interesting, really cool project, and it was. Um, so yeah, Mary got me on board, and it was really fun, especially in the midst of COVID, to be reading through all this poetry and really um, thinking so much about how people live in their places, right? So um, I thought the timing was actually really perfect, and the anthology is coming out at a great time for everyone to be reading this kind of stuff. Fantastic. And Bernie, how about you? Well, I, I, am, I am a professor at Montana State University Billings. Um, and through my career, I've, I'm, I'm fundamentally unspecialized, I think. Sometimes I'm writing poetry, sometimes I'm writing essays, sometimes I'm writing criticism. But I think I got to more directly involved in this process as a result of a, a review essay I wrote for a journal. Um, and one of the books that I reviewed happened to be Sarah's book. Right. And I think uh, that sort of brought me back into the uh, the realm of eco poetics, which is uh, where I've been living for a couple of years now, it seems. <laughs> OK, well, I'm, I'm going to note that this is a really large and complex project. It has a lot of contributors um, and maybe um, Mary, maybe you could uh, summarize for us what the project is about. Eco-poetics is a really huge field, and uh, there are many approaches to it, and many had already started. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we really, I think, each of us has a slightly different point of view, which would, would you know, which can come out in our discussion. But for me, the important thing was to find a voice um, which wasn't just anthropocentric. In other words, not just concerned with how uh, the environment impacts on human beings. And so in our criteria, our criteria for looking for participants, I think, you know, that was forefront. The other thing is that uh, we really are all writers, one kind or another, and we were very interested in language and how language is used. So that was more important, um, as important as, as the, the content. But basically we wanted to be as broad as possible in in making an invitation for people to contribute, to participate. We wanted really um, <clears throat> the full spectrum of types of writing and types of writers. 
But, you know, of course, some people accept your invitation and others don't uh, for whatever reasons. So the result is always um, what it is, you know? And I, I think it is quite miraculous that we have contributions from people who are very well known, famous and well rewarded. And we have at least one contributor for whom this is her first, very first publication in the book. Um, and we have writers from Australia who were writing out of uh, fire zones, you know, as well as city dwellers and so on and so forth. So um, um, it's, I think the, the most important thing is that um, ecopoetics, I know I'm not supposed to be defining it now so much as the project, but they kind of overlap. It's not writing about nature, but it's seeing how one is actually a part of and positioned in relation to nature, uh, the living environment, the ecosystem, including other human beings. So from that point of view, it, it, it interfaces with a lot of generally known as political topics but always with the, the living environment, not just the human environment um, as part of the focus. So I'll let someone else continue from there. There's much else to say. S Sarah, maybe, maybe uh, you could yeah. elaborate a little bit. Sure. I'm, I mean, I think uh, for me, I, I, I agree with everything Mary said, especially just all the eco-poetics sort of broken up into so many different veins at this point that we have the more activist side and we have the more formal side and um, and we have the more nature oriented side, right? So I think that in some ways there's definitely some overlap with traditional nature writing, nature poetry. Um, but for me, what, in, what has always interested me most about eco-poetics is its ability to engage all kinds of environments, right? So while it um, it certainly can have the more ecocentric feel, I think that Mary's getting that. Um, I'm really interested in how it can draw places out of unnatural spaces, right? So how people can engage with their lived environments, um, whatever kinds of environments those are. Uh, and I thought that was one of the really great things about this collection was that we were able to find all of those different kinds of eco poetry, right? We really have a, a broad swath of types of spaces that are represented and different ways of interacting with those spaces. So some are definitely edging toward the more traditional nature poetry. Um, and some are really pushing forward into this like sort of newer waves of eco-poetics and eco-criticism that are thinking more about um, new spaces and also new ways of engaging with those spaces in terms of uh, thinking about things and thinking about materials in, uh, in new ways from what we saw with traditional nature writing. Okay. Well, Bernie, I, I know that you and I have talked a little bit about different kinds of nature writing. Could you maybe summarize uh, those types of writing? Um, maybe. <laughs> I, I think one of the things that separates, uh, you know, so in kind of massive poetry anthology, uh, Anne Fisher Worth and Laura Grace Street divided the field as far as poetry goes into three parts. There's nature writing, which is kind of the traditional, often romantic, um, Wordsworthian, uh, coming you know down to the present through people like um, Wendell Berry, right? You know, uh, and and then there's um, there, there's a, a environmental poetry, which is more uh, political and, and more uh, uh, um, you know on its face um, advocacy, right? Ecopoetics is, is more concerned with breaking down the distinctions between the human and the, and the non-human and the systems in which we are all enmeshed, including the writing itself. The writing itself is part of those systems. And so we have people like, uh, we have some poets like um, Adam Dickinson, who does physical experiments involving himself, right? And then converts those into verse. Right. And uh, you know, Jonathan Skinner is, a, is another 
guy who, another poet who's in the book, he's in it, he's interviewed in the book, uh, he's part of an interview is included, but he takes, he does experiments like taking bird song and slowing it down and doing what he calls slow listening and trying to make that part of his creative process. So eco-poetics tries to be systemic and systematic and it's, well, not systematic, that sounds pre-programmed or something, but systemic in its understanding of the relationships involved. Wow, okay. Yeah, I, and I could add something to that because I think Bernie brings up something important, which is for most of our writers, it's not just about writing, it's about a practice. It's the way you are in the world, what you're exploring, and that feeds into your writing, but it's not like you sit down at your desk and decide to write eco-poetry. It's, you know, you're, you're, <clears throat> you're trying something, whether it's political or whether it's a growing something, you know, understanding the environment in some way, looking at third landscapes, the neglected landscapes, you know, in cities. In my case, I live in an ex-urban area and I try to plant for pollinators, but I face on a daily basis the fact that there is no raw nature left. You know, I live near a woods and everything, but aside from the slope and the wash off of all the topsoil, you know, it's been affected by human, everything in our lives has been affected by how humans have lived here over a period of time. So we're never kind of starting fresh, you know, I think, so that's one of the principles is that you can't really separate nature and culture. Um, so any idea of kind of purity, natural purity is kind of a figment of the imagination. And yet you can recreate that sense of a living environment of, of the, the magic, you know, that you have in early romantic poetry or something, you can still find those moments of ecstatic encounter in the world as it exists, you know, without putting on blindfolders. But, um, <clears throat> but anyway, it's the engagement, I think, that's really um, important in the, in the quality of the work as it comes through. Bernie mentioned a few people. There, um, another writer there is Orchid Tierney, who's Australian, although she's working in the United States. And she, for instance, did a long history of certain rivers and pollution and so on, but then her actual poetry is quite quite experimental in form, you know. So there's that also that choice of how to bring into language uh, what you've come up with in your explorations, you know. I just wanted to sort of second that. Um, and I agree with Bernie, that's really one of those distinguishing facts of eco-poetics, right, is that attempt to make language do something, right, to make language work in a way that we haven't really tried so much in other forms. Um, and again, I think that's something that we see a lot in this collection, but is also uh, common throughout eco-poetics when we talk about someone like Jonathan Skinner, right, who's really thinking about how language and form can work together to create something on the page that we weren't trying to create with nature poetry, right? We we're, were having a different kind of interaction with creating, as Mary said, but also with reading that kind of poetry um, because it's more, it's a different kind of experience to more traditional forms. Okay. Well, I understand that uh, uh, this event right now is about, you know, one of the few times that you've all seen one another uh, and you're, you're uh, certainly geographically far flung. Um, how did you work together, it's three editors on a complex project like this? Anybody, Mary, your there microphone's were... off, but uh, do, you, do you have any observations on that? I think Bernie looks like he wants to say something. Okay, Bernie. I think one thing that happened in the course of this whole project is that each of us had times when we were distracted by one thing or another and unable to involve ourselves as directly as we should have. So we sort of almost tag teamed through part of the, uh, Mary, Mary was really the captain of the ship, especially early on. Um, but there were times when we would come in and we also had different 
kinds of skills that we could bring in. Sarah's really uh, uh, good at, at compressing files and things like that. I mean, I, my idea of compressing files is like you get the heavy object and put it on top of them, right? You know, <laughs> but, uh, but Sarah knows how to do that. So we were able to use kind of uh, skills that are complementary and also uh, associate fields of associates that were complementary. We could bring people into the project from different areas that way or different, different uh, um, yeah, different areas. Okay. Anybody else? Well, we did a lot of online organizing, you know, so I think that it really helps to have places like a Google document or something where you can all find the same information. So things don't get out of sync. And, and we got, um, there's always a point, I think, because as I say, we start, I started this with no idea that it would sort of blossom, but there's always a point where you need help. And it's really wonderful that people in this field are often very generous. Um, for instance, L Linda Russo was one person who kind of stepped in and, and uh, the cover of this book actually came about because we didn't have a budget for design and she created a con contest at her college for the students in the art department. And our cover came out of that contest. And for me, that was really a special, uh, very special that we, we were able to engage some students who otherwise at this time would be even more isolated than they were, you know, it was a positive experience for them. And um, <clears throat> so there were all these sort of inputs, I think it's at strategic points that, that I thought were very positive and kind of increased the whole field of the project. And, and Bernie will tell you about the book layout, which, um, which he, his student facilitated. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Actually, I, uh, I interviewed Bree Barron uh, and talked about the book layout. She did a, a really terrific, very thoughtful job on it. And uh, it's, it's a, an underestimated skill set to be able to organize a book to make it attractive like this. So, well. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to maybe wrap up by just asking, uh, do any of you have any current publications you might like to just mention uh, at, at the end here? Sarah, your microphone is still on. How about it? <laughs> do you have anything current? Um, I've been so swamped with teaching remotely and adapting with COVID. I don't have anything like that in the work. This was all I could muster. <laughs> <laughs> it's plenty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. well, I do. Yeah, I do have a few things going on. I've published some poems um, in Blaze Fox and other places, and I have a chapbook that's now in contests. So we'll see. Cross your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bernie, how about you? Your microphone's off, but I uh, I, I have a long-term project that just that I'm not the editor of that I was a contributor to that just came into fruition and it's upside down or backwards there because of the but it's called the field guide to the poetry of Theodore Recchi and I was a contributor to that um, but Mary and I are also editing a, um, a book which we are working with two other editors on so uh, we, we internationalized our team essentially to do the uh, the Routledge um, Eco, uh, companion to eco poetry, and that's that's kind of a follow up project, more on the line of a purely critical sort of of, of um, coverage of the field. Whereas our book here is mostly um, mostly poetry with some commentary at, at the end. Yeah. Well, it's amazing, and I, I just really appreciate the the time that you all have taken today to to visit with us and. Uh, tell us about your book. So it's a great project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thanks. <laughs>